So last week we observed uh, Jesus and his disciples in an upper room. This is in 1 Corinthians 13. In an upper room sharing a last meal together before Jesus was arrested and crucified. And he had many things to tell his closest followers before he would go away from them. Uh, as the men gathered and ate the meal, no one had volunteered to take on the role of the least among them or the least servant in the household, and that was to wash everyone's feet. So Luke told us that uh, at that time a, a conflict had broken out between these guys over who was the greatest among them. Uh, and, and so, well, the greatest among them was Jesus, obviously. There was no dispute about that. They believed Jesus was the greatest among them. Uh, but, there, but what about the others? You know, what was the pecking order after Jesus, you know? And uh, so uh, this argument had come up before. Jesus had always responded by telling them that the greatest would be the one who humbles himself, and then, and then God would exalt uh, that person. But, but they, he had to keep repeating this teaching to them and this ad, ad exhortation to them. But he had told them that the greatest in the kingdom are those who take on the role of the least, okay? The least uh, among them. In other words, being humble of heart is the path to greatness uh, and greatness in the kingdom. And this was the kind of person that, that they needed to become uh, in order to be great in the kingdom of God. In his humility of heart, uh, as if the least among them, Jesus took a towel and a basin of water and began to wash the disciples' feet. Uh, and after he had done this, he told them these words. He said, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So in a sense, the scene that flows uh, from the humility of Christ Jesus there in the upper room is the greatest act, uh, it, it, it is a picture, if you please, of the greatest act of humility as he laid down his life for the sins of the world. And someone said it this way, Jesus rises from supper, just as in the incarnation he rose from his place of perfect fellowship with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. He laid aside his garments, just as he laid aside his glorious existence. He takes a towel, just as he took upon himself the form of a servant. He wraps a towel around his waist where he had come to serve. He pours water into the basin just as he was about to pour out his blood in order to wash away human sin. On this remarkable occasion, Jesus perfectly staged a portrayal of his whole life from birth to death to resurrection. It was a dramatization of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning and let's read those verses together. Uh, as Paul uh, declared what it was, what the incarnation is, that Jesus left his glory in heaven, came and lived in a human body, and then lived a sinless life that he then laid down out of obedience to the Father and took on the role of a servant among us. And, of course, the, the washing of the disciples' feet demonstrates that. So let's read this together. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and be became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So let, uh, let this mind be in you. Let's make a, a note in our hearts and minds that Paul says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. When we truly become disciples of Jesus Christ in our hearts, then we receive the mind of Christ so that we can serve as he served, so that we can love as he loved. And so that comes from a heart of humility before the Lord. So let's pray today before we get into today's teaching and let's open our hearts to what Jesus has to say to us. What else is in his heart and mind for his disciples? Father, thank you today for sending Jesus Christ, your only begotten son, who left the glory of heaven and wrapped himself in human flesh, dwelt, in, dwelt among us, experienced every temptation, everything, every pressure, every tribulation in life that we go through. 
and took upon himself uh, even death for, the, for all of our sins. Pouring yourself out, Lord, that's what we worship you for today, that you have done this for us. And now, Lord, we pray that you would indeed uh, just do a work within our hearts and minds, a work that we would uh, have flow out of a heart of humility, the opportunities to serve one another as you have served us and be as the least among us. In Christ's name, amen. The Lord bless you as we go into the teaching of the word today. So we're going to be today uh, in, again in John 13, beginning in verse 18. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now, Jesus had just told his disciples that they would experience great blessing from serving one another as if each of them were the least among them. At this point, he reveals that there is one who eats the bread of fellowship and friendship with him who will not treat him as a friend, but rather as an enemy. He quoted from Psalm 41, verse 9, when he said, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted ate my bread. He lifted up his heel against me. And so this was a fulfillment of the, that uh, messianic uh, word there in Psalm 41. So one would think that if Jesus said this as a sort of final warning to turn back from uh, the, what the betrayer was considering doing, that he would reconsider that he would say, no, I can't do this. This is the Lord. This is one who has loved me for over three years and given himself to me for over three years. How can I turn myself against him and betray him? So you would think that that would happen, but the betrayer's heart was already hardened toward the Lord and he was under the influence of Satan. So look at verse 19. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now, Jesus knew at this point that the faith and the solidarity of heart among the disciples was about to be shaken. They were going to go through some very chaotic and confusing times, uh, and they would uh, experience uh, uh, some really tough times there. And he wanted to say this to them in advance, that, th that this is going to happen. This, this one who was considered a friend is going to betray me. And the one who has received this bread of fellowship and friendship is going to turn against me. And so that they would know when this actually happened, and it would happen really before the night was over. That, that it was something that he had told them about in advance, and he already knew it. He was expecting it, and so this would be a help to them. And so this is a reminder to us as well, as he declared to them that, that basically all of heaven would be supporting this, that the Father in heaven would be supporting this and standing behind it, that, that when we encounter the darkness of this world as well, even when people we thought loved us uh, stop loving us, when people we thought were friends uh, maybe betray us, then Jesus Christ and our Father in heaven is standing with us and supportive of us and able to help see us through those times of confusion and difficulty just as the disciples were about to go through. Verse 21, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. So when it says he was troubled in spirit, we understand here Jesus being a human being, just like we are, uh, he was troubled in spirit. That meant he was, uh, had a, a lot of things going on inside of him. There was an emotional upheaval going on in him. This was difficult for him to handle, you know, the fact that one of the men he had been with for over three years was about to betray him. So at the beginning of chapter 13, we read that Jesus loved his disciples. He had loved them intensely. He had laid down you know, everything for them, and, and he had loved them in every way, including his betrayer. Have you ever been betrayed by somebody that you thought was a close friend or somebody you thought really cared about you? You know, there's deep sorrow in that, isn't there? there it's problematic to us emotionally. I mean, we just really go through it. We, you know, we may lose sleep, sleep over it. We lose our appetites, you know. We go through all kinds of sorrow and grief over that. 
Well, Jesus was going through that very thing as he contemplated what this man that who was one of his original 12 disciples was about to do. The disciples were shocked at what Jesus said. They began to look around and, and think, well, who, which one of us is it? And so here's what happened in verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And that was John, by the way. And John was reflecting about, about how Jesus had loved him. And Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, the way dining was done back in the Middle East at that time was that people would lie on their left side uh, and they would prop themselves up with their, uh, their elbow, you know, their arm and elbow there. And then uh, they would angle their feet back away from the table. Uh, and so for John to speak to Jesus, he was seated next to him. For him to speak to Jesus, he simply had to lean back against Jesus' chest and look up, you know, and say, okay, Lord, Peter wants to know who it is. Uh, and so that's what John did. Uh, and so uh, Jesus basically told him who it was. Uh, and uh, he told John that the one he offered a piece of dipping bread to uh, would be his betrayer. To offer the bread was to offer was a gesture of friendship and fellowship. It, uh, uh, Jesus had already washed the feet of Judas Iscariot, uh, and had, he next offered a gesture of friendship to him. Now, it was the nature, you see, of Jesus, and still is, is it was the nature of Jesus to keep on offering grace no matter what. You know, he just couldn't stop doing it. And the only time he stopped doing it was when it was finally refused. And this also tells us that Judas was seated to the left of Jesus, which was a position of honor. Uh, and so that's an interesting thing, too. The thing about grace from Jesus is that he already knew about Judas and his hardened heart, uh, yet he did not hold a grudge toward this man. Uh, he didn't let that any bitterness arise in his heart toward him. Uh, Judas had uh, offended him uh, just recently when when uh, Mary washed the feet of Jesus with that expensive perfume. He criticized Jesus and probably had done it many times because his heart was getting hardened toward the Lord. Uh, and so Jesus still offered, though, the 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 grace that was in his heart to this man, the friendship and the fellowship and the favor, uh, you know, giving him opportunity to turn and say maybe a different way can be, you know, God, the Father can choose a different person or a different way for this to happen. And so he always offers grace even to us today uh, as we uh, follow him. Now, let's think about what it really means to be like Jesus, to serve in humility as he served, to love as he loved, to offer grace to people as he offered grace, even to a man who had become his enemy, he offered grace. Uh, and so, you, you know, to be like Jesus, guys, is costly. It's not easy to choose to be, to do as Jesus does and to be as Jesus is. What does it cost us? Well, it costs us our pride. Uh, it costs us the right to reject those who reject us. It costs us the freedom to be vindictive toward those who betray us. And so to be like Jesus is to continue to offer grace to every person, regardless of what they have said about us, what they have done to us, you know. Uh, and, and so it's hard. I can tell you it's not easy to do that. The flesh wants to, to get back at people. The flesh wants to reject those who reject us and, and to really, you know, do something, you know, to deal with this person who has betrayed us, you know. But, but we offer grace, you know, even in, in the most difficult situation, hoping that that person's heart will turn toward the Lord. Verse 27, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast so that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately and it was night. Now, Judas uh, could live a double life no longer, uh, so he gave himself completely at this time to Satan's control. 
Now Judas sent, or Jesus sent Judas on his way because he had many other things to share with the other 11 disciples. And it was night, it says, or let's say it this way, and it was night. You know, that's a dramatic phrase right there for Judas, isn't it? For what he had done, it places uh, this, this, and it was night, it places a frame around what Judas had done here. He had turned from the countenance of light emanating from the face of Jesus. He had turned from the light of, of, of the grace that Jesus offered uh, to the darkness of Satan. Now Judas likely did not realize, most people don't realize, G Judas likely did not realize uh, the extent of Satan's seduction and the darkness and malevolence that was in Satan toward him. That Satan in reality just wanted to use him and destroy him. And he didn't, he didn't understand that, and most people don't. I uh, once saw the previews of a movie where Satan appears to, to this guy in the form of a beautiful woman. Uh, she convinces him to sell his soul in, ex, uh, in exchange for her granting his wish to be rich and powerful. But what she did is so indicative of how Satan works. Uh, she turns this guy into a drug lord. That's a way to get rich, right, and powerful. Apparently, he became rich and powerful, but he cannot enjoy it due to the fact that he keeps getting shot at by all of his enemies and competitors, and he keeps getting pursued by the authorities, the DEA and all that, you know. Uh, and uh, so he can't enjoy the riches and the power that he has attained by giving himself, exchanging his soul to Satan. Verse 31, and Judas, you know, by the way, could not enjoy the money that he was given in exchange for betraying Jesus. Uh, and so, verse 31, So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. So now that Judas has gone to do this uh, dirty deed, Jesus announced that something beyond the understanding of the disciples. They just didn't get it quite yet. They would eventually get this and they would enjoy it but he says that God will now fulfill his purposes and will do so quickly uh, Jesus had already been speaking about the hour that was coming he had said that to them many times it's getting close it's getting close it's getting close and now he says essentially to them the hour is here we're right on the cusp of it this is something that's going to happen immediately uh, in verse 32, he said that his glorification was coming immediately. Now, the word translated glorified here uh, means that, that what is good and wonderful about God's plan is revealed, or about to be revealed. Uh, the whole reason for the coming of the Son of God uh, into the world was about to be realized, and that was the glory being revealed to the world. Little children, verse 33, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. Now, Jesus knew what was ahead for him and his disciples. He would be arrested, tried, crucified, and then raised from the dead. Uh, he would make appearances to his disciples between his resurrection and his ascension into heaven. Uh, and encouraging them and teaching them many things still before he went away. But then he would ascend back into heaven and he would be gone. He physically gone from them. And so he, he, he would be seated at the Father's right hand. In the book of Acts chapter 1 it tells us and he would be pouring, uh, pour, uh, chapter 2 rather, be pouring out his spirit from the right hand of the Father upon uh, the you know, as he quoted from the prophet Joel, it's, it's your sons and daughters and all people, all flesh would be able to experience the coming of the Holy Spirit. So he would ascend to the Father's right hands, but they would not be able to see him and touch him and, and that physical presence would not be there with them. So for the remainder of the evening, Jesus would be equipping his disciples for the time after he physically left them uh, to the place where they could not follow him. At, you, at least not yet. Although in chapter 4 he does tell them, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that you can eventually be with me. Okay? So, but at this time they could not follow him. And then in verse 34, he said, at the end of verse 33, it says, I, This is what I want to tell you. 
A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. A new commandment, uh, that you love one another. Now the Old Testament includes the commandment to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. I want to look for, for briefly at how uh, loving your neighbor was defined uh, in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. In Leviticus 19.13, you shall not cheat your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. Leviticus 19.16, you shall not go, out, uh, go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Uh, in verse 18, uh, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So to love your neighbor in the Old Testament, this Old Testament commanded, commandment included not cheating or robbing your neighbor. Um, it, meant not, it meant paying your neighbor immediately for services rendered uh, as soon as possible. It meant not repeating gossip about your neighbor. Uh, it meant not speaking against your neighbor in public. It mean, meant not being vindictive or bearing a grudge against your neighbor. Uh, so the Old Testament commandment for loving, loving your neighbor was to not withhold what you owe your neighbor and to essentially all the other things to do your neighbor no harm, okay? So if you could uh, live and function, you know, around other people and not do people harm, then you were fulfilling what it meant to love your neighbor. Well, Jesus calls this a new commandment because he adds the defining phrase, as I have loved you. Now, that's a whole lot more than not doing harm, right? It means doing a lot of good. It means to, you know, be a person of compassion and touching people with, with love and, and, and to serve others. And, and so as he loved them, and so he adds that new commandment as a, with a specific purpose, and that's that the world would know, he said, that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. Now, the word translated love here is agape. Uh, it means to un unconditionally choose for the uh, highest good of another, the best and highest good, most benevolent good of another. Uh, this is a love that is contrasted with eros. Uh, eros uh, is based on attraction or admiration. Uh, it's based upon sensual things, on st sensual stimuli. How does this make me feel? You know, that I get a buzz or a warm feeling. Boy, it feels good, doesn't it? You know, that kind of thing. You know, that's what Eros does. Uh, and so agape is also uh, contrasted with philos, which is the uh, word for love in the Greek that's based in the homogeneous bonds of friendship and brotherhood and sisterhood, you know. That's where people of a feather flock together. You know, our birds of a feather flock together. You know, I, we do bird watching. Vicky and I do bird watching out on our patio. It's a bird sanctuary. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, I didn't do it for a while, but now I've gotten to do it every morning. I go out there. That's my prayer room is the patio during the warm weather. Uh, and uh, so I go out there with the birds and the flowers and uh, all this. And, and Vicky's surrounded the place with flowers and plant life. And, and it's like a little Eden, you know. It's, it's wonderful. And, and so I watch those birds, but you know, the cardinals hang together, the wrens hang together, the finches all hang together, and the morning doves all hang together. They don't mix because birds of a feather do flock together, you know. And so that's the way friendship love is. You know, we like people, we like to hang around people who are like us, right? And uh, you don't want to get into it, but back in the... 70s and 80s, there was this, they called it the church growth movement. And, and we were told in all these church growth conferences, you know, if you want to have a big church, well, what you need to do is target a certain population in, in the community, a certain demographic where people are all alike. And so you're going to have a church to have the biggest church. You have a church where people are, are just alike, you know, and the people can say, well, I can go to that church because people there are like me, Right. And so the word gets around, said, well, the people like me go to that church. Well, 
I, after a while, I said, no, that's not what the body of Christ is about. The body of Christ is about diversity. You know, it's about how those who had been slaves and those who were free and, and, and they know people, the rich and the poor, everybody can be the same together in Christ. So Christ is the defining uh, thing that we have between us. You know, not the fact that we're in the same social network or we're in the same age group or, you know, the same educational focus, you know, those kinds of things. And, and so I rejected that, that thing. And I said, no, that's not the kind of church I want to pastor, you know. We'd like to have a church that has people from all walks of life that can come to it and feel safe and grow in the Lord. Now, agape was rarely used to describe love among the Greeks, whose primary focus was on eros. That was the kind of love that the Greeks really embraced, uh, given to impulse and temporary fulfillment of self-gratification from the world's point of view, because the conviction then was that agape... Uh, was so selfless, lacking in immediate feelings of pleasure. You know, the Greeks were really into pleasure and beauty and attractive things, you know, and buildings and artwork and all these things, you know, just wonderfully attractive and, you know, makes us feel good when you have them around us, you know. And, and so, so they were really into that. It seemed practically impossible to really uh, do this agape love. And so they pretty much ignored it as a possibility. And so in the world, uh, it was forgotten pretty much as a word for love. And so eventually, Jesus used it a lot in his teachings to his disciples. Uh, the Apostle Paul used it. All the, the, the followers of Jesus, when they wrote letters, they also included this word. that says agape love is the most important thing to all of us. Uh, and, uh, and so it became a word that was essentially just used for the love of God. Uh, and for the love that was shared in the Christian community. Uh, and so eventually it could only describe that. Jesus gave definition to agape love as other-centeredness versus the self-centeredness of eros, which is based on what others do for us or how we feel when we're around others. Uh, eros is temporary, ending when the positive feelings go away, you know, uh, and... Uh, that's why Christian marriage has to have more than, than erotic love, more than eros. It has to have more than just friendship involved with it because those feelings come and go. But agape remains. It's the umbrella for that holds marriage together. It's the umbrella that holds the church together. Um, agape love is the love of God that we are asked to embrace and to give out to others. So uh, eros is temporary. Uh, it, it goes away usually because the other person is no longer gratifying what we want the, uh, us and what we want them to do. You know, oh, they don't do what I want anymore. So, so, that's, so that's that eros love. So where immediate feelings of attraction to others and philos is based, feelings of attraction to others and philos is based on the affection of friendship, which was important in the body of Christ too, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote about how to be committed to brotherly love, to philos as well. Uh, but uh, agape is based on neither of those things. It's not based upon a friendship or attraction to others or admiration of others or feelings that we have when we're with others. It's a deliberate choice for what is for the highest and most beneficial good uh, for others. The others type of love, the other types of love are dependent, listen, on what others are doing for us. So it's a more self-focused, these are more, more self-focused in nature. Uh, but agape is from the inner motivation of the Spirit of Christ. It's his love in us. When Jesus said you are commanded to love one another, the disciples were faced with a real dilemma. Who do you think they hang, hung around with when they were together? All oh, the guys that were like them, you know. There was one guy, he was Simon the Zealot. You know what he was? He was a terrorist. He hated Rome. He's a guy, one of those guys who had carried a, a knife around, you know, a, a dagger in, under his cloak. And if he could stab a Roman, he'd do it, you know. And then you had Matthew, who was a tax collector. And Matthew was in, you know, was in Rome's pocket. They paid him to collect t taxes. And then he could add as much as he wanted to onto that to, to, you know, to pad his own pockets. Now you got Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector uh, who are on opposite ends of who they used to be, you know, 
One hated Rome, the other one's in Rome's pocket said, well, they, they pay me, you know, so I got to, and, and, uh, and, and so can you imagine Jesus walking up to those two guys at the Last Supper in front of Simon the Zealot? He's on one end, I think, of the table, and Matthew's probably on the other end. And he says, you two guys come here for a minute. I want you to stand real close to each other and look each other in the eye. I command you to love one another as I have loved you. And so this was a dilemma for these guys, you know. Uh, they, uh, they, until then, until Jesus said that to them, they had the opportunity to, to hang out with who they wanted to hang out with. They had the opportunity to choose whom they cared about and whomever they felt the warmth of friendship from. And naturally, they would reject or ignore people who were unlike themselves or who did not induce positive feelings when they were with them. They, of course, just like we are tempted to do, had little cliques among them, hanging out with people that had similar interests and all these things. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't forget there's a whole lot of other folk around too who need the, the love of Christ being poured out toward them. So think about it. Is there a person in this church or another church that you've been a part of that you just really did not like? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But, I, you know, it's crazy. I have known people who have left churches simply because there was somebody in that church they didn't like. Well, they're going to wind up leaving a bunch of churches before it's over with because there's going to be people everywhere they go they don't like. You know. But agape love changes us. It changes how we approach people, how we deal with people. And so uh, the, it's a love that, that Jesus even said, that it's a love that, that will, will reach a point that, that you can have for even your enemies or those who spitefully use you. He said that in the Sermon on the Mount. He defined agape love there as being not being dependent upon those who love us. He said, you know, anybody can love somebody who loves them, but if you want to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, what are you going to do? You're going to love your enemies. And you're going to bless those or pray for those who spitefully use you. Now, how many of you find it really easy to do that? There was a guy, he's actually one of my heroes of, you know, his name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a pastor of, in Germany during the Nazi regime. Uh, and he and his beloved confessing church uh, were severely persecuted by the Nazi government. And uh, they were persecuted for not conforming to Hitler's demands. Listen to what he wrote. But love must not ask if it is being returned. Listen closely to this. Love does not say, well, I'm not inviting them over because they've never invited me over. I've heard people say that. You know, we invited them over and they never asked us to come over to their house. Hmm. So love must not ask if it's being returned. Instead, it seeks those who need it. But who needs love more than they who live in hate without any love? Who, therefore, is more worthy of my love than my foe? Where is love praised more splendidly than amidst love's enemies? Wow. How would that play politically today? <laughs> the starting point for love, though, is with fellow believers. You can't, you can't get to that level, you know, of loving your enemies without first getting to first, going to first base. <laughs> and that's to love your brothers and sisters in Christ this way. The practice of agape love begins with what Jesus told his disciples in the upper room. Love one another as I have loved you. Then as love is perfected into maturity, then we graduate to loving our enemies. Here's the truth. Agape love is impossible without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. 
You know, just like Paul wrote in Romans, you know, there's always this battle going on between the flesh and the spirit, right? So the Holy Spirit's prompting us and motivating us to love someone who's unlovable. And what's our flesh doing? Say, no, don't do that. They, you know, they don't deserve that. You know, they don't deserve your, your love, your attention. You know, look what they did to you. When the Holy Spirit keeps motivating, love them. Do an act of kindness toward them. You know, take them a meal, you know. Yeah, so uh, that's what the Holy Spirit's doing. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans, uh, Romans 5, 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So agape does not originate with us. Agape love does not come out of our fleshly nature. It comes through the gift of the Holy Spirit that resides in us. Consider what Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia. Galatians 5, uh, 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And then in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. So the Spirit produces agape love in us. It motivates us to love like that. Jesus told his disciples as they reclined at the table, that, at that supper that evening, that when they practiced loving one another as he had loved them, it would mark them as being his disciples. Uh, I read a book when I was in college called The Mark of a Christian. Uh, it was written, written by a guy named Francis Schaeffer. Uh, I highly recommend that you get a hold of that little book. It, it revolutionized my thinking about what it means to love as a believer, as a Christian. The mark of a Christian. Jesus echoed this truth in his first epistle, or John echoed this truth in his first epistle, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. That's where it comes from. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So that's our DNA, guys. That's our spiritual DNA, agape love. That's who God is. That's what he does. That's who we are to be and what we do. Agape love is the DNA of those who truly have been born again by God's Spirit. Jesus was telling his disciples that, that loving one another like this will be so radically different from the more sensual eros that is expressed in the Greek and Roman world around them, or by all the world really, without this, the Holy Spirit, that it would be, that it would be so radically different from that that everyone would be able to identify them as his followers. That's how different it would be. Jesus challenged his disciples to no longer allow their emotions or personal feelings to dictate how they treated people or treated each other. Making a choice for other-centered agape love versus sensually-based eros love would set them apart from the world. The world's eros. God's love, agape. This agape love was practiced so effectively in the early church that it was said they found favor with all the people. All the people said, look at those guys. Look how different they are than the world around them. They love one another. They're generous. They're selfless. You know, they share everything in common. You know, they're forgiving and kind and generous. They're just real different people. And it, then it says, God added to the church daily those who believed. That is the atmosphere and the environment to which God adds people, you know. When we love like that, it is the mark of a believer or follower of Jesus Christ. And then loving one another as Christ has loved us, guys, is the most effective tool of evangelism that God uses. All right. It is said that the last words of a conversation are what we remember the most. Jesus saved his most important Exhortations to his disciples for his last 
evening with them. He showed them by example how important it is it was to be people of humility, so much so as to be as the least in a household, one who is secure enough in God's love to wash the feet of others. Those who would be as the least among them would be blessed, he said. It is a great blessing to serve. Then Jesus gave new meaning to the command to love one's neighbor by adding, as I have loved you. This exhortation from Jesus is passed on to us. It wasn't just for those first guys in that upper room. He instructed us to treat one another as if we are him. The call to us is to quit responding to people based on how they make us feel. Hello? The call is to a higher level of love than that. To love as he has loved us, that love moved him to lay down his life for us. When did he do that? While we were yet sinners, he loved us. While we were ugly on the inside, he loved us. Lord Jesus, fill us with your spirit so that we can love one another as you have loved us. Let's stand together. I'll tell you what I do when I, before I teach anything to you guys. I put it to the test in my own heart. <laughs> I go through, okay, Jerry, you know, look at this. What does this mean to you? How's this been working for you, dude? <laughs> you know, how are you walking this out? You know, and I tell you what, the Lord just had me through the grinder this week. Say, all right, have you been loving people like this? What about this person over here and that person over there? And what about the people out there? And, you know, what's going on with that? And I did some repenting this week. And, you know, I, I feel really good about God. And I ask the Lord, fill me with your spirit, Lord, because I want to love like you loved, and like you love me. Father, in Jesus' name, I come before you, along with my brothers and sisters who are gathered here. We've got this fleshly nature, Lord, that keeps rising up and squawking at us about how hey, you deserve this and you deserve that and... Lord, we know that that's not your way. We really want to just ask you, pour out your spirit into our hearts. And we know that that means that you'll pour out your love to overflowing in our hearts so that we can choose for the highest and most benevolent, make the, most highest, the highest and most benevolent choices for those around us, beginning with our families at home and with the household of faith then, Lord, we're willing that you would also form in us that great love of your own mind and heart for even our enemies. Lord, move in us according to your plan and your will. Forgive us, Lord, for making choices based upon eros, that base level of love that, that's selfish and Depends on how people make us feel. Wash us clean from that, Lord. Like you wash the disciples' feet, wash us from that. And make in us a new type of love, your love, that we might be known to all those around us that, <laughs> as your disciples, that you might add to the body of Christ daily those that believe because people are witnessing your great love among us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. God is good all the time. And he's loving all the time. Enjoy his love every day. And let his spirit arise in you with his loving kindness every day. And may God bless you with that. And may he make his face to shine upon you. 
And may the, the love of God produce joy in your heart. For the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then comes joy. Then comes peace. Then comes gentleness and meekness and faithfulness and self-control, goodness and self-control. All of these things come out of the flow of God's love in us. Lord, do it in us. Amen.